Yeah, I'm lo looking forward to, to talking to you guys. Sorry I can't be there in Seattle. I'm dropping my daughter off to college this weekend, so uh, just wasn't possible. But um, it's so exciting to see the young faces of people online and also in person there in Seattle. Uh, Rod, thank you and Seattle Science Foundation for putting on this course every year. It really is a tremendous resource. Uh, and, and I really enjoyed watching Jens do that amazing uh, dissection. Uh, you know, you're learning from a lot of masters. So they've asked me to talk about something a little bit different, which is more stylistic and philosophical. Uh, and this is really uh, the result of me having seen a lot of my older friends go through periods of their lives that are very complicated. And then seeing a lot of the people I love who are young, like you guys in the room, struggle through things that you uh, you are dealing with. So it's very exciting to me. We could go and talk for a whole day about these things in little tangents about why it is that the average ortho and neuro spine surgeon um, changes jobs within the first two years at a rate of about 50%, stuff like that. There's a lot of things to think about as you guys embark on this wonderful journey. So well, with your permission, I'm gonna share my screen. And this is a talk I put together for my chair's uh, president's address, I should say, for the SUNS, which is the Society of University Neurosurgeons. So I entitled it The Seven Ages of a, of a Spine Surgeon. And so first thing, I, I, I think I'm talking to mostly millennials, right? maybe a couple of Gen Z, but uh, it's trigger warning. Like, you know, some of the things I talk about, people are going to say, wow, you know, I don't like what he's saying. It makes me feel uncomfortable. I will tell you, if you listen to a talk and you don't feel something, and it could be positive or negative emotion, then it wasn't a good talk, okay? And I think about the people that are on this in this room, uh, this virtual room, the spine surgeons, ortho, neuro, we're apex predators, ortho or neuro, right? We are the top of the medical food chain, right? We are the highest paid doctors out there. And it, it is a very interesting scenario, right? Because, you know, patients view us a certain way and our lives are very, very hard and very complicated. And I think about this, this is a picture of the big six. These are the apex predators, if you will, in Africa, right? Uh, this is if you're a hunter, people are always seeking these and to understand what their life is like versus the life of some other animal. And I think about this big six. This is uh, three of the phenomenal neurosurgeons that have formed our field including Victor Horsley, uh, Harvey Cushing, and Lars Lexell, who invented the gamma knife for the orthopods out there. And I think about the early explorers like Sir Edmund Hillary and Jacques Cousteau and Neil Armstrong, and your lives are going to be like this. This is what makes spine surgery so cool and exciting and dangerous. And you've already heard just now David Aquanco and, and Jens Chapman sort of having a little bit of a uh, repartee about, you know, what is the safe way to do this surgery that might kill or lock in a patient if you don't do it right. So think about it from that perspective. So anyways, the, the title of the talk is borrowed from this, uh, uh, this, this statement, if you will, this poem from Sir William Shakespeare. And it's about the seven ages of man. And everybody knows about this in concept later, but Shakespeare was the first to put it down uh, in pen and writing. And the, the stages are the infant, the schoolboy, the lover, the soldier, the justice. The pantaloon, right? So these are, and sorry, and the second childishness. So these are the stages that we're gonna we're gonna talk about. And as I tell you this, I want you to be thinking about your stages in life and who you are and how you see yourself and how others see you, because that's a very important piece of why I'm even giving this talk, right? And let me just couple give a couple of disclaimers. One is age, as I define it in this talk. It's not purely chronological. It's not a generation. It's not about being 30 to 35. It's also not purely a state of mind. You cannot uh, just say, look, I feel young, so I'm young. It is, it is part of our biology. One of the things you're gonna find in life is one of the weird things about when you run into something unusual, it's often a dyssynchrony, an asynchrony between a person's view of their age and what they really are. It's like when you see an 80 year old man with a 20 year old woman, something about you is like a little cringy, right? Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but you're like, wow, that doesn't seem like quite right, or if you see like a 13 year old drinking too much or doing drugs, seems very, very weird, right? So you think about how we see ourselves and what the realities are and what that means in terms of your ability to become the better person, the better surgeon, the better father or mother, the better friend, uh, partner, colleague, whatever you are. So a couple of disclaimers for me, I have not passed through all the ages. Nobody, I think in all of this uh, talk today has been through all of them. I do not claim to have done this well. Uh, I, I think I've done it okay, but you can judge anybody's uh, past and say, well, they did this part well and this part poorly. A lot of what I say comes from personal experience, but more importantly, it comes from talking to other people, surgeons, 
orthopedic spine surgeons and neurosurgeons that do spine and, and finding out about their experiences. It, everybody's got an interesting set of stories and interesting life, right? Now, if you're a neurosurgeon, you know the red journal. I think ortho it's blue and white. We have a, a red and white. And this is one of the best papers ever written. This is by Alan Friedman in the red journal. The uh, year of this was 2008, I think it was. And this is a great paper because in this uh, paper, Alan uh, Friedman, who was the former chair at Duke University, talks about the different generations and how we're going to train them to be amazing surgeons. And he has this great four by four table where, and I'm not going to read it all to you. Just go look at this paper. It's amazing. What every generation thinks about the other generation. So here he's talking about the veterans. So those are people like over the age of 80, right? The baby boomers, we, they have their stereotype. I'm a Gen Xer, right? And then the nexters, which we now call millennials at the time, they're called different things. Just like, we don't know what Gen Z is, the coronials, um, you know, whatever the generation that follows you guys, right? My kids are in that generation, but it's amazing to see this, 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 uh, this four by four about what people think about other generations, right? This is a, a topic of great levity and conversation and philosophy as well. So I'm gonna use a parable for this. Uh, this is uh, me and my three kids uh, years ago in 2006, Michael Puzo uh, had set up the, um, the uh, Creativity Award and George Lucas came and I had an opportunity, I'd look much younger there to get my picture taken with George Lucas. And I love Star Wars, a nerdy Asian guy. So, you know, we love Star Wars. And you know why? Because it is the American epic opera, right? It is our opera. It is our epic. It's easy for people to relate to. They're easy to identify and realistic characters. And it's in multiple iterations, probably in its sixth iteration now. So we all have this personal journey. And these are stereotypes, right? These are generalizations. Nobody fits purely into a stereotype. None of what I say is intended to be ageist to the old or the young or the middle age. And then there's some people that are neotenized. This is an important feature of surgeons as well. Uh, if you're familiar with an animal called an axolotl, it's a, it's a larval tiger salamander. And in lacking iodine in the caves of Mexico, they never turn into the adult salamander form. So they're neotenized uh, because their thyroids never mature. And so the idea is that you can have this Peter Pan syndrome. You'll see this in surgeons. It's quite common actually. So some people just stop at one age and they never progress past it. I don't want to give individual examples, but you, you guys are all thinking about the people that I, I know you'll be thinking about. It's, there's nothing necessarily wrong with it, but it's just something to be aware of. So these are the ages, again, the infant, the child, the adolescent, the young man, the middle-aged man, the career twilight, and then the senescence, right? Now, why even talk about this? You guys are like, this is so uninteresting compared to Jens Chapman doing C12 fusion. Well, okay, first of all, entertainment, right? By, uh, by To provoke thought, to stimulate discussion, let you think about things for yourself, about what, you're, what you are and what you're going to be, maybe prepare you properly for your lives, maybe have meaningful change uh, so that you can take a positive direction, right? So let's start with this. So the, there are some medical students I know I'm always milling about in the Seattle Science Foundation, um, but the infants, right? Who are these people? These are people that are below you. These are people in high school, college. My kids are in this stage and they are doing various things. They're establishing a general base of knowledge or learning work, e work ethic and discipline. Uh, they're developing morality and ethics and they're sort of finding themselves. So this is like the young, young Anakin Skywalker when he's encountered on Tatooine, right? Before he's discovered as a future Jedi, right? And there are tremendous positive elements of this, which is there's no limit to their potential. It's amazing. If you've had babies, you've seen how fast they grow within day to day, they're changing much faster than like Jens or Rod or David or I can change. They're amazingly full potential. They have complete freedom and they get forgiveness for making mistakes. You can't ever be, be angry at an infant, right? You really shouldn't be. But there's some pitfalls. Very easy. Most people, not this group, most people fall into aimlessness. There's a lot of competition. And the mistakes you make, let, let's say you get, a, uh, uh, you get arrested, you get a felony record, it's, it's lethal, right? It's really, really deadly. So you have to think about the, the implications with their ripple effect going into the future, right? And so for the people in this group, if anybody's listening, I recommend you read books like this. This is from uh, Admiral William McRaven. It's a very simple read. It takes about an hour to read it. It's called Make Your Bed. He's the one who staged the Zero Dark Thirty. Um, whether you like or dislike all these things in the American military, I'll use the example, which was, uh, which was an important time in, in America's um, dealing with uh, Afghanistan. So... Then we go on to the next stage, which is a child. This is uh, when you're in medical school. So there are a lot of important milestones. 
You're learning the vocabulary of being a doctor. You're developing interpersonal skill sets. You're getting your first real certification, your MD. Now you're a doctor. That's the first time you usually get anything that's other than you're just a student or you work at Starbucks or whatever. You were in a lab. And then you're becoming sure of neurosurgery or orthopedic spine surgery, right? You're starting to get to feel for what is what is your tribe in terms of medicine, right? And there's a lot of positive traits, a lot of security with peers, right? You see them do things that we don't do. You don't see all the Seattle Science Foundation ortho neuro guys having lunch together and huddling together. Hey, let's go have lunch now, right? But you do that in medical school. You still have tremendous security in your peer group. And you even see it in later stages, but you lose that with time. It becomes a very lonely road as you get older. You get accomplishments, but no responsibility, right? So first time you do something, you're like, yeah, I got this. I, I, I sewed up my first wound. I got my MD degree. I got my first paper published, but you're not really responsible for any of that. Your mentors take all the hits right now, right? So you have complete freedom of exploration and you can still change your career path, but there's some big pitfalls Obviously, people talk about it a lot now, financial dependence, uh, student loans. A lot of people waste a ton of time. I think uh, I see Jens there in the front. I think Jens and I, if we were 20 years old again, we can think of all these things we would want to do again, and we wouldn't have wasted so much time doing stupid stuff. Uh, Jens probably wasted less than me, but I certainly wasted a lot of time. And, and you get a lot of uncertainty in terms of your direction and conflicting viewpoints um, from, from many sources, a lot of bad information from your peer groups, right? So this is an amazing uh, picture, a figure from a paper that was written uh, in, in published in Archives Internal Medicine. Okay, this is interesting right now. This is for the neurosurgeons in the room. So this is a two by two table showing the rate of burnout on the X axis and the work-life balance satisfaction on the Y axis. Now, when people talk about this, you, you probably have thousands of articles out there in the lay press on YouTube or in Twitter talking about, well, you know, work-life balance is the secret to not burning out. Well, so if you just basically, you know, have a good balance, you're going to be balanced and good and happy, right? Okay, so I'm a neurosurgeon. Okay, that's a bunch of bullshit, okay? Because the ortho spine guys are like the neurosurgeons. We're similar uh, uh, phenotypically. So what you'll see is there is a regression line for doctors, and everybody falls along this line, which is that if you have a better work-life balance, you burn out less, right? You can see that regression line, but there is a major outlier down here in the bottom, which is neurosurgeons, right? And I'm gonna put ortho spine in this group too, have a horrible work-life balance and we don't burn out easily. This is part of the selection process of how you become a spine surgeon ortho or how you become a neurosurgeon, right? And this is a very important point that you're trying to decide in this stage of your life. Now, I'm gonna make the quick disclaimer. I, a lot of patients have said, I've seen you on videos. I'm like, I don't have videos on the internet. I don't do that, I don't market. And I'm like, no, 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 we saw it on Seattle Science Foundation, right? This is a conversation intended not for patients and I don't care if patients hear it, but this is about us. This is not about patient care. This is about what we are about, very reflective on ourselves. We can talk about patients all day long, right? So the next stage is adolescence. This is your residency or fellowship period. This is your training period where you're learning the craft, the art. It's your first real job. You're working out kinks and your first major life events. You get a dog, you get married, you have a kid. You're doing these things. And this is how it feels, right? You feel like the young Luke Skywalker with Yoda on your back. So this is like, who would be, who would be the senior people there? Rod could tell me who the senior people are in the room. But this guy's on your back, like tell him to do this, do that. And you can't make sense of it. You're like, why are you making me do this? This doesn't make any sense to me. I don't want to do it. But you have to trust your mentors because they know best. They know what's good for you, right? The good things about this, you still have a defined trajectory. So you still have just show up at work. They're going to tell you what to do. And if you do your job, you're not going to get yelled at pretty much. You don't have a lot of attrition anymore. Most people who start an orthopedic or neurosurgery residency are going to be a surgeon, right? You get early authority. This is incredibly empowering. You feel like the man, right? The first time you save somebody's life, the first time you have a good outcome, you know, you have a purposeful existence. Everybody's giving you this track. And if you actually just follow that track, barring it being in a crappy program, you're going to really feel good about what you do if you can show up to work every day. But there are some pitfalls, right? There's a tremendous amount of workload. It's a rigid hierarchy, right? Like the military. You get responsibility, but you don't have independence, right? You don't really have that independence yet. You have to delay your life. All your friends who go to law school or business school or whatever, they're making money. You're making nothing. You can't pay off your loans, right? And you're not really realizing the value of your training. You're not seeing why 
you're doing this and all these hours and all these horrible things that you have to do in terms of supplanting your normal life goals, right? So then you get to the next stage in life, which is the young man. This is the young attending. And you guys uh, will start if it's in academics, you're assistant professor. If not, it's your first job at Harvard. You'd be called a, uh, uh, you're called a, uh, what do you call it? A teach, not a teaching assistant. You're called a uh, supervisor or something like that. You're not even assistant professor. And so the milestones are you get independence. Okay. You're trying to get board certified and you're starting to have your first real complications. This is the first real bouts of depression that occur is in this stage. My mentor, Michael Puzzo said, the hardest three years of your life are the first three years of, as, as an attending. I laughed at him. I said, I worked 120 hours a week as a resident. You can't beat me harder than that. And he was right. The first three years of his attending is the hardest years of your life unless you grew up in a very, very impoverished environment or in the third world. So positive traits, you're making money, financial rewards, your self-determination, you get self-actualization, you can go where you want. You've got geographic freedom now, but huge pitfalls here. First time, there's no track. There's no script for you. You can't function without a script. You can become lost. Super high rates of turnover, right? Onerous self-doubt. The need for feeling certainty in the face of uncertainty. You're not sure about what to do on your first case, I guarantee you. But you got to show the people that you know what you're doing or everybody's going to laugh at you. The scrub techs, the nurses, the anesthesiologists, your partners are going to look around like, oh, man, that guy doesn't know what he's doing, right? You need to act confident even though you don't feel confident. And huge expectations. So you're married and your spouse says to you, I went through a hideous residency with you for six or seven years. We made no money. I supported you. Now's my payday, right? I'm not saying your spouse is like that, but you get the idea. Whoa, you're an attending now. You're supposed to be like, now's the payback, right? Now you're, you're, and you feel like an imposter syndrome. So this is a huge deal. Now for these last two stages of life, right? This is important. This is during your training and your first couple of years, you get this. Overconfidence will in the protection of the brood with almost no experience. Right. This is what happens. You see this happen every day with residents. First time you do an IM nail, you're like, yeah. Right. But actually, if you fuck it up, someone's going to bail you out. Right. So you're really not that good. You think you're good, but you're getting better. Right. Then you get deflation. Right. As an attending, because you're like, oh, my God, like, actually, I, you'll, you'll see this fellows at the end of the fellowship. They all do the same thing. They go running around to all the attendings, ORs, and go, can I have the preference cards of Dr. So-and-so? Um, yeah, and by the way, uh, let me ask you about this, because they're finally realizing, oh, my God, I, I wasted all that time in the ER sitting there like, oh, my God, I, I'm going to They're not going to let me do this screw, but I'm not going to watch either because I don't want to seem like a fool. When you're missing the pearls that are being dropped right in front of you, okay? Now, why is this? There's something called a Dun Dunning-Kruger effect. Some of you may have heard of this. This is a very interesting concept. So it originated from, from David Aquanco's hometown in Pittsburgh when uh, these bank robbers went into a bank and they put lemon juice on their faces and they were totally photographed and videoed. They're like, no, no, that's invisible ink. Like we got invisible ink on our face, right? They're so stupid, right? They're people literally that dumb, right? Well, we all suffer from this to some degree, right? So this is the Dunning-Kruger effect. This is the curve where when you first get a little experience, like your patients say, yeah, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing, right? You get super confident, but it's only when you get enough experience that you realize what you don't know. So this is the classic Donald Rumsfeld quote, which is there are the known knowns. These are the things that we know. There are the known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know. And then there are the unknown unknowns, the things that we don't know that we don't know about. Right. So this it seems like a weird statement, but it's a very, very telling statement about the reality of how our human brains work. So then you move to the next step, which is the middle aged man. This is like the young Obi-Wan when he slayed three Sith. Right. Obi-Wan was amazing because he had that. And most of the Obi-Wan uh, love comes from his middle age stage. Right. So this is an associate professor mid career. Now you're surgically proficient, you're polishing career, you have incredible economic potential, your nuclear family is finalized, or maybe you've restarted it, right? Maybe you're on your second or third marriage already, but you have the wherewithal to go at it, right? And so the positive traits is the pinnacle of your career. Unquestioned authority. Every mid-career guy who's worth his salt walks in the hospital, I run this place, right? I am the biggest producer, I do this, I do that. You see it every day, right? It's happening around you as we speak. Minimal physical deterioration still feels strong, but there are major pitfalls. Hubris, 
boredom is one of the most significant pitfalls, right? Missteps here have big economic and social impacts still, but the biggest pitfall, and this is very common, is the belief that this goes on forever. And Jens had mentioned the late Henry Bowman, who's one of the greatest orthopedic spine surgeons to have lived. And I think that you can see a lot of this mirrored in a lot of the great neuro and orthopedic spine surgeons of our era. And this is Harvey Cushing, so mid-career, this is what they're talking about. 1918 to 28, he published six books. This is before now, now it's easy to publish books. Almost 100 scientific papers. This is on a typewriter. When these works were analyzed, it was estimated that he wrote more than 10,000 words per day in addition to the surgeries and all that stuff. Picture who in this room writes 10,000 words per day of anything? This is Harvey Cushing. This is what a true mid, uh, Jens Chapman writes it, right? He raises his hand. That's right, Jens is that kind of guy, right? So then there's the career twilight, which is like the full professor, the head of the group. These, uh, these are uh, elements of, of wisdom added to your skill. You have authority, presence, but the inevitability of biology. This is a big one. Biology catches up to us. So the positive traits of pressure is finally reduced. There's nothing you haven't seen. And, and, and many of your mentors in this course are like that. They, there's nothing they haven't seen that you think you've seen. They know every, they know every move you're going to make. I can spot them. When the residents or fellows tell me something, I, I know exactly why you're saying that. When they're trying to sneak around and do something for some advantage, I'm like, I've seen that a hundred times, right? We've seen every iteration clinic, right? You have free time now, right? You have a second chance. You still have a chance. You see this happen. A fourth family, a third family. It's really interesting how surgeons fit various archetypes. A lot of pitfalls, right? Economic uncertainty if you haven't planned properly. Physical deterioration. You're now obsolete. You can't learn the new stuff well. You are starting to lose your peers. They're dying. And now is when you have regrets. You're like, I should have done it different when I was at this stage, et cetera, et cetera. And they'll talk to you about it. And you should ask them about it because you can learn a lot from them, right? So here's Michael DeBakey, maybe the greatest surgeon in North America, the history of North America. Uh, and he says, I wouldn't mind being operated on by a surgeon of 91, which he said when he was 91 years old. So you see how that is being reflected in someone like Michael DeBakey. And then there's the retirement, right? This is the emeritus professor, the closing of the career, the extension of your worldview, the coping with mortality, right? And the positive traits is finally you have the time. You don't have to struggle anymore. There's no struggle left, but really you lose your identity. You're no longer the person you were, right? Uh, whether you see it or not, and, and you usually lose the ones you love. You start, you can lose your kids, right? So this is a very, very interesting time this is like the old luke skywalker that's that's being revisited in these these newer movies of star wars right so you know this is a very interesting thing when you think about burnout and you think about what happens in terms of, of what we do burnout at every stage of the seven stages of your career if you will right um and i encourage you to look at it in the interest of time i'm not going to go too much into this stuff which is things like figuring out your second acts but in summary i would tell you look the reason I give this talk, this is from Confucius, by three methods we may learn wisdom. The first by reflection, which is noblest. The second by imitation, which is easiest. And the third by experience, which is bitterest. Unfortunately, most of us try to take the third route because we have too much pride and ego. I'm not exempt here, uh, but I hope that maybe you guys can reflect on this and think in your personal lives, or your family lives, or your work lives about how you can all do things better for our patients. My, I'm taking my daughter to, to college uh, this weekend. This is her being born. Uh, our life, our lives are super intense and amazing. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I love and live spine surgery because I mold that and meld it with my personal life. And this is really what's special about what we do. I'm sorry I'm not with you guys in Seattle. Please, Rod, do a shot for me with the group. Thank you for listening and um, enjoy the rest of the meeting. Michael, this is Jens Chapman. Every lecture that I've ever heard of you is an experience, a positive one. So thank you on behalf of everybody so much for your important words and this uh, awesome kind of a ride that you gave us on. And as a surgeon, in essence, I obviously want to try to, to kind of stretch it out a little bit. But I have a practical question for all the youngsters here in this room, and that is, in dogmatic, pragmatic years, on average, two numbers, how long does it realistically build, it take to build a practice, a legitimate self-standing spine practice? And how long until you're really a safe surgeon in terms of handling 98% of vagaries of spine life? You're asking me, Jens? 
I'm asking you directly. Who better to okay. ask than you? you have so let me just make an aside that I talk about Jens Chapman and almost all of my talks for a very specific reason. I believe, and I don't want to sound arrogant with this, but I, you know, I've done a lot of first in man stuff in MIS, one of which is percutaneous iliac screws. Maybe somebody else did it, but we certainly published it first and we published the first series and we invented that technique at a time when nobody had that. Now everybody talks about it. It was only made possible because Chris Shaffrey told me to look up a paper Jens Chapman had written in the journal Spinal Disorders and Techniques where you wrap those hanger wires, those wires around the ilium. And you show that you could get what's called the obturator outlet view, which everybody calls a teardrop view now. And we use that to target percutaneously. Now people use the robot or navigation. But before then, nobody was trying to do that, right? So listening to people who have a lot of experience, even if you can do some cool stuff, and having a network of people, so network tonight with your with your colleagues there, is really, really critical to if you want to be um, cutting edge. Now, that's part of the answer because what Jens is asking about is, when are you going to be busy? And I will tell you that don't ever worry about that. If you're good, you're always going to be busy. I think it takes about three years to get a good reputation and to be busy. The hard part about being proficient is if you calculate proficiency based on your repertoire of, let's talk surgical technique. There's, I think clinic management is more important than surgery even, right? But let's talk about surgery. What is your repertoire width or breadth and what is your depth? So if your repertoire is, okay, I can do an ACBF, a microdisc, an A-lift and a PLIF, you're probably gonna get that proficiency. You do a hundred of each of those, probably within five years are gonna be actually very, very good because you're only doing those surgeries. But if you say, I'm gonna do a lot of weird surgeries, I'm going to do a T10 to the pelvis. Then I'm going to do an endoscopic discectomy, which are so different. You're challenging a huge breadth of surgeries. Then if you take all the deformity stuff across a big swath, right? And you take all the minimally invasive across a big swath. And we haven't even gotten to spine oncology, arthroplasty, all the other stuff. You say, well, if you can do every surgical procedure in the spine, and there's about 77 distinct procedures without going by level, side, or whatever, uh, every every procedure is distinct, but I'm saying like this total disc replacement, cervical, total lumbar disc replacement, that's two procedures. Take those across at 77 procedures that I've counted in the spine. It's going to take you 30 years, like a European professor, to be proficient because some of those surgeries are going to be less common. Uh, say thoracic calcified disc herniation, um, costal transversectomy approach. How many are you going to do? Like, let's say you can do 10 or 20 and be good at it because you're already a good surgeon. It's going to take you a decade to acquire those cases, right? So I would say it takes 30 years to be a true European professor, but to be very good at doing surgery, probably five to seven years and you can get it. Great stuff. Brilliant. It's always thought provoking, multi-layered depth. So uh, I'm in awe of your lectures. Always great fan. Should we move on?